It's time! Hey, Dave, listen up, please. Scotty, uh, that's a great question. Uh, I got a question for you, though, Scotty. You know uh, that there's other players on our team besides Desi. But what are you waiting for? I don't know. Something amazing. Jones for three. And he banks it in. Bailey. Up and in and a chance for three. Welcome into the basketball podcast of Mid America. I don't know if you noticed, Scotty, but the intro has changed up just a little bit to reflect last season's results. Cool. Yeah, we got a little bit of a. You get a shout out in there as well. Um, you know, from a good old Eric Musselman about. Did you know that there are other players besides Desi Zills? At the time, I was unaware, but. But apparently, you've now it's you good have to be been. In the know. You have been made aware now. I also saw where you made the Razorback basketball Twitter accounts. You made a video from them, from one of your tweets. Yeah, I made a little cameo in Desi Seals' hype video. I was honored to be in the video of the greatest Arkansas basketball player ever. (laughs) So, in all honesty, I think this podcast not only has Seth Campbell and joined alongside Scotty Bordelon, but I think that you might be a famous movie star by now. Uh, As I sit here in in the flesh and see you with my own eyes, uh, I, I, I can't confirm or deny the fact that you might be famous now, Scotty. I, I'll disagree with that. <laughs> hey, everybody's dream is to star in a Razorback Twitter video. Razorback basketball Twitter video. There's enough words there. Anyway, we got a stack show for you today. We're going to talk about the series that Scotty and Matt have been working on called Before They Were Hired. Been pretty fun. It's really interesting. Knocked those interviews out last week. It was, it was some, some fun interviews. If you haven't read them, the link is in the description almost stop now and go read them. They're fantastic. Um, but you'll get some background on those stories. And then if you want to wait until after the podcast, I guess you can do that. I don't really think it's good podcasting etiquette to send people away from your podcast in the middle of it, but yeah, dude, we're like two minutes in, (laughs) but that's how good these stories were. Trust me on that. You need to go read them. Um, and so we'll talk about the muscleman and Mike neighbors ones. Um, muscleman's is just quintessential Eric muscleman. Right. Exactly what you'd expect from him. Then we also have got the APR is released, Academic Progress Reports. And if you're as confused as I am, that's why we have Scotty Bordelon here to... That's why we have Matt and Bob (laughs) to help explain it to Scotty so I can try to explain it here. But uh, we we had to talk about this before the show even started about what that means. So we have those and we're going to try and explain that to you as well, the... And then the last thing that we've got on the docket today is we got a little game action for you. I went back into the archives, listened to a bunch of press conferences. Some of those are not as entertaining. And you can definitely tell the demeanor between Eric Musselman when he wins and loses in the (laughs) post-game press conference when you're looking at them all back to back. But I went back. I found some sound from some different coaches and some from Eric Musselman. They're describing players on the Razorback basketball team. I'm going to play them for Scotty. Scotty has no idea that I was doing this. And so he is going to have to guess the player that they are talking about. And if it is a coach ra- other than Eric Musselman, I'll give him a bonus point if he can name the coach. Okay. Yeah, I think I can do that. All right. He's confident. I, I'm, I'm confident in being able to recognize the voices for sure. Okay. Even of assistant coaches that Arkansas has played? Assistant coaches? I mean, not assistant coaches, of visiting coaches. Oh, that... yeah. Yeah, I think so. Okay. We'll see. Also, on the Basketball Podcast Dominican America, we have to start with our final Last Dance recap. I'm almost sad to watch it leave, Scotty, because now I don't know what I'm going to do on my Sunday nights. But it was good. Yeah, I don't either. Like, the Last Dance and American Idol wrapped up on Saturday. What a terrible, terrible tragedy. the guy that Mallory and I, my wife Mallory and I, thought was going to win American Idol, finished second to someone that we agreed should have definitely been in like the top five, but I was pretty hurt. Like I just, I didn't know what to think. And if you followed American Idol, like you probably agree with me that Arthur Gunn should have won. Yes, I agree with you. Yeah. I didn't follow American Idol, but I, mean, I trust your taste. You should go to YouTube and listen to, if they got some of his performances on YouTube, I mean, there was no question in my mind that he should have won. And I was, I was like, what are we doing here? <laughs> Like, I thought this was supposed to recognize, like, the most phenomenal 
singer, eh, performer. Eh. American Idol's always kind of had that though. Of it's all, like a popularity contest. I too. mean, they they gave. I mean, the American Idol winner was a girl who had overcome like a ton of adversity in her life. She like her biggest role model is her grandmother. She's a she's a good singer. I didn't think she was like a great singer. Arthur Gunn was a great singer. Mm. He was a great singer. So, I mean, I'll hop off my soapbox, I guess, so we can talk about The Last Dance now. Yes. Well, there's some drama around The Last Dance because Horace Grant came out on a radio station in Chicago and basically blasted MJ in the documentary because if anybody said anything bad about MJ... Called it a so-called documentary. Yeah. uh, Then if anybody said anything bad about MJ, that that's not what was edited. And he was really upset that MJ blamed him for leaking... Uh, information about the oh book. for Sam Smith's books the Jordan rolls mm-hmm. yeah but regardless of what happened there I thought the documentary was good and I think somebody brought up a pretty good point of you know Jordan probably agreed to do this now because they've had this footage for forever and he finally agreed to it and you kind of thought that maybe it would take a while for them to put this out um, but they finally agreed to it because maybe he thought that there was a challenger to his legacy to his status as one of the greatest of all time in LeBron James. And he wanted to make sure to put it out there that, you know, he still thinks of himself as the greatest. And the people that played with him think of himself as the greatest as well, which after watching the last do- dance documentary, I could see why they think that for sure. Yeah. I thought it was a really, it was really well done. I thought it was like throughout the series, I thought it was kind of strange how they kept hopping from the second three peep to the first three peep Mm -hmm. and then you know you get to episode six and seven six or seven and then they start diving into the baseball side that was like that was it was unique like the 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 way that they told the story i think the timeline i thought they did a decent job and best job that they could of they have all of the back back scenes uh, behind the scenes is what i meant to say there behind the scenes footage from the last season, from the quote unquote last dance, right? With Jordan and the Bulls and Pippen and everybody. It was incredible stuff. Which is, yes, fantastic. But they did a good job of weaving it because you just don't want to watch the season of just the season of 10 episodes, 10 hours of behind the scenes stuff. They did a good job of weaving that in with a humanizing story of Jordan, where he came from and what happened between that. And then also his main cohorts in Pippen, who got a shout out in the first two episodes. And then Dennis, Dennis Rodman, Rodman yeah. who is, I mean, that that right there, I know that there's a Rodman documentary that I it's haven't unbelievable. I haven't watched yeah, yet. Yeah, you need to go watch that next. But it makes me want to go watch the Rodman documentary because of his ex- exploits in Las Vegas and yeah. just taking a break in the middle of the season. I wanted to go back and watch the Rodman documentary after they showed the footage of the, uh, the Bulls head PR guy trying to sneak him out of the arena when there were like 300 media members oh that's in the arena yeah and he sprinted up the stairs and then you know there's some chubby cameraman trying to oh man trying to catch up with dennis rodman like how you think that's gonna go (laughs) this guy's a professional athlete you you are not yes trying to chase this dude upstairs yeah Yeah. that was crazy i also thought the the steve kerr story now i didn't know that his father was i mean that was unbelievable i i did not know about that Um, i thought it was interesting that jordan and steve kerr never talked about their fathers yeah um i feel like that could have been like a bond like a bonding point for them but i also understand not wanting to talk about it Mm -hmm. like i don't know that i would want to talk about it with a teammate or a teammate that's so hostile at times is jordan too I don't know. You can almost think of it that maybe he sees that as a weakness. Two things I learned about Michael Jordan. This is really sad, but I was born and I didn't really get to see Jordan with the Bulls. Like I was alive when Jordan was doing his thing with the Bulls, but um, I'm not going to tell you how old I was because you'll be like, oh. I was but, like six when he finished off the second three-peat. Yeah, I was not six. <laughs> I was younger <laughs> than that. Um, but... So I didn't really get to see that. So I got to see his greatness. But there's two things that I learned. Number one, you do not ever, ever talk trash to Michael Jordan. That man will make up reasons. We saw in the documentary of ways to beat you. 
Yeah, don't even think about it. Like, so why don't, <laughs> don't even like try to cultivate something in your mind because he'll, he'll he'll find a way to figure out what you're thinking. This man makes up reasons to get an edge on you. Don't give him one. Don't wake it to where he doesn't have to waste the time thinking about a reason to hate you. That's one. Don't talk trash to Michael Jordan. Number two, like Jordan demanded respect. And I think Steve Kerr is a great story you know, when you mentioned him about how you know he didn't back down from Michael. He's like, I am not the most talented player, which is kind of funny to me because he's an NBA athlete. He's one of the top of the tops when it comes to basketball. But still, he knew that compared to Michael Jordan, he was not a great basketball player. But he's like, but I had to fight and earn my respect. And he got just straight up punched in the face from Jordan but he earned from that point on he earned Jordan's respect and he was Jordan trusted him to take the last shot and win the NBA finals I think that that's two things that I learned about Jordan and his legacy through the last dance documentary are you buying the pizza story I don't know I, I honestly 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 didn't know that that was the thing I thought it was still the flu I know that that had been reported yeah but I mean, there's also theories that, you know, he was hung over, which I'm not buying it because why would Michael freaking Jordan be hung going over. into one of the biggest games of his entire career be partying all night? Yeah, no, that's I don't believe that either. He didn't have a legacy of doing that in the other finals. So why would he do that during this one? There were there were some tweets about the, the pizza story that I thought were really funny. There was a guy, um, he goes by Network on Twitter. He works at The Ringer. He he tweeted, quote, hello, this is Michael Jordan of the Chicago Bulls, and I would like to order a pizza in my name. Yeah, I thought that was weird too. How did the guys know? Was it because they ordered it to the hotel? Or did he yeah. legitimately put his name on on the pizza? I'm assuming that it was because they ordered it to Everybody the hotel. Everybody in Salt Lake City had to, like, they knew where the Bulls were staying, right? And like, they just assumed. Yeah. Like, when I would go to St. Louis to watch the Cardinals play when I was growing up, like, I mean, you could just ask a couple of people and they would be like, oh, yeah, this is where the Chicago Cubs are staying this weekend. Like, you knew yeah. where the you know where the opposing team was staying. Like, you knew what hotel. There's like six suspects, maybe, in a, t- a town like Salt Lake, you know, of uh, hotels that are going to be nice enough to fit a professional basketball team, especially for the finals. Yeah. You got to get like, you got to get like the front desk to put that order in. Yeah. Concierge to do that. Mm-hmm. Just... Somebody you can't besides, be like, hey, I need a pizza for Michael Jordan because immediately, like, you're in enemy territory. I I don't know, man. Right? I I felt like you should be smarter than that, but maybe not. I felt like they sure surely they didn't do that. I'm not Sh- buying it, really. Mm-hmm. So I just I just think like you can get sick at any point. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like you could just get like a stomach bug from just like the most routine things sometimes you know what i mean like some of those so like stomach bugs and whatever like what was ailing him that the morning of that game and that whole day like that can just that can just pop up sometimes i don't know that it was i don't know that it was the i don't know if it was food poisoning food poisoning is one of those weird things why did we can... just hear that it was food poisoning i felt like, like somebody all these years that. later because everybody up until now, like it had been dubbed, like the, it was the flu game. It was the flu game. And then now, however many years later, it's food poisoning. Well, I had heard some people say that they knew that they're like, oh, yeah, I thought everybody knew that this was food poisoning, not the flu. So I, I, some people on Twitter had prior knowledge of it being, quote unquote, food poisoning before the Last Dance documentary. I didn't. And I guess the you know, food poisoning game doesn't roll off the tongue as flu game. Right. But I don't know. Pizza Gate. <laughs> I saw several people calling it Pizza Gate on Twitter. I thought that was really funny. I, I tried to stay off Twitter during the the Last Dance. Oh, I love just, getting on just Twitter. trying to just trying to enjoy it as much as I could. But and then going back and reading the tweets after the fact is okay. is always really funny. I I like it because it's it's a shared experience almost between me mm-hmm. and the people on my Twitter account. That doesn't really happen anymore because there's not any live sports going on. Yeah. Same time I just don't want I just don't want to be looking at my phone or my laptop the whole time while the 
series is going on. And I will say, I only do it during commercials. And that way yeah. I keep loading it so that all the tweets are popping up. And I, I can like, I know what points when people are tweeting about something, I know what was on the screen right. and what was happening. But I won't ever catch up because the commercials aren't long or weren't long enough. So I would never catch up. But all in all, fantastic documentary. Did ESPN hook you into watching any of those other documentaries that they're going to put out? Definitely the the one diving into the home run chase with Sammy Sosa, Mark McGuire. That's the one I All over to. that one. I had a plaque on my wall when I was little. I think it said something like the home run kings, and it was Sammy Sosa and Mark McGuire in the same picture. And you can see the veins are just like – the veins in their forearms are just getting ready to pop. Just like so much steroids. I mean, yeah. In there. Yeah. Looking back, like looking back now, you're just like, geez, those guys were juicing, juicing. You know what I mean? Yeah. That That's going to be really fun. Maybe we'll get to see bleached Sammy Sosa in the, oh man, in the series. That'll be fun. Oh man. Sammy Sosa. The memes that are going to come out from that are going to be incredible too. I'm ready to watch that one. They didn't hook me on the Lance Armstrong one. I don't know. Even though that's a pretty big scandal, but yeah, I, w- I wasn't interested. All right, moving on. We'll talk some Arkansas basketball now. Let's move into before they were hired. And as we said when we started off this podcast, Eric Musselman's before they were hired is just quintessential Eric Musselman. Scotty. Yeah, it was pretty, it's pretty interesting. Just, you know, you ask him, like first question I asked him was like, all right, I'm going to take you back to last April when, you know, it was rumored that, you know, Hunter Juracek and Arkansas were reaching out to him and he got an initial phone call. It was kind of a, it was kind of a get the temperature of Musselman's interest type of phone call from, from Arkansas. He said that went well. And then there was a, a second phone call where, you know, your check and, and John Fag were like, Hey, I think we, we want to come, want to come out to your, we want to meet face to face pretty right. much. So that second call went, Musselman said the second call went really well. Um, and then your check and John Fag flew out to Reno, Nevada to meet with Musselman at Musselman's home. They had discussed potentially meeting at a hotel um, you know, maybe just to kind of stay a little bit more off the radar, but Musselman was like, Hey, why don't you guys just, why don't you just come out to the house? I mean, what's the harm in that? Mm-hmm. So Hunter, you and John Fag make it out to Reno on the same day that a report surfaces. That, that was so strange. Eric Musselman was in Arkansas interviewing for the open men's coaching job. Can I just say, if you think about this logically, anytime there's a coaching search from now on, this is not going to happen. I mean, I can almost assure you that this is not going to happen, but I'll say 99% chance. Coaches don't really visit campus anymore. Like They don't have to come in and see the campus, see the facilities, all this kind of stuff. Especially when you're in the SEC, it's an arm race for facilities, and most of the time everybody's are more or less the same. It's kind of, if you know the fit and you're going to know the personnel, the people that you want to work for, which is the AD, uh, John Fagg as well, what the kind of culture is, what you what you can recruit, all that kind of stuff. You don't necessarily need to go to campus. So if you ever hear a report about a guy visiting campus, unless you see a picture of that guy on campus postmarked, then I would not believe that a, a college coach is visiting any Division One school. There's also this thing called the internet where you, know, you can you can hop on like I don't know maybe arkansasrazorbacks.com and you can click on facilities you can click on Bud Walton Arena scroll down oh that basketball performance center is pretty nice Bud Walton Arena is pretty nice campus is really nice you can even like, like Google Maps will show you all of this stuff like, yeah yeah i the fact that people visiting campus now that's 1970s that's not 2020 so the day that Juracek and John Fagg came went out to, to Reno to meet with Eric Musselman, Danielle Musselman was on her way to the gym when Juracek and John Fagg arrived at the house. She greeted them. She put the dog, their dog Swish, 
in the in the SUV. Which is funny. And so she left for the gym. She had one stop to make before she got there. She dropped Swish off at Doggy Daycare, which I think is great. Um, and then she went to the gym. She left her phone in her car while she was working out because she didn't want to be bothered. And after the workout, she goes back out to the car. She checks her phone. She's got a ton of missed calls and texts. And the messages are something, they're pretty much all along the lines of, you didn't tell me Eric was going to Arkansas. And they're so like, imagine being the the head coach and the head coach's wife in a city. Like you're entrenched in that city. Like you're very well known. Everybody, like everybody knows you and everybody's trying to keep up with you. And so as soon as they hear rumors, they're like reaching out, trying to figure out if this is real or not. Mm -hmm. Because obviously those folks don't particularly want them to leave. Right. So <laughs> I talked to, to Danielle, um, the same, the same phone conversation with that when I talked to Eric, she said the day Hunter came out to visit Reno, it was just awful. That's when everything started up online. At that point, it was totally a rumor. The rumor got shot down pretty quickly. Then we didn't really hear anything for a couple of days. So the final four was coming up. I think Eric and Danielle left on a Wednesday and by Saturday, Eric had been told to call Chancellor Joseph Steinmetz. And then later that day, Hunter Yurchek offered Eric Musselman the job. So take you back to after that second phone call before Yurchek and John Fag show up to the house, Eric Musselman, like he got, he got to work. Eric Musselman did what Eric Musselman does. Yes. After a year watching Eric Musselman at the University of Arkansas, we know that this is what he does now, but you didn't know what this is what he did back then. So he said he started, so before this, um, so Eric said before he got the initial call from Arkansas, he got another call from a different Power 5 school. And so before Yurchek and John Fagg came out to the house, he was doing research on the two schools. And he said, um, you know, I did research and felt like Arkansas was a great job because of the history. He heard Hunter was a great guy to work with. And he knew about the history of Bud Walton Arena. And then he just started watching as much tape as he could to get familiar with, with the SEC. And he was preparing for that interview as best he could. Like he was watching, I mean, he was watching game film on like Synergy and different, you know, different sites um, to just get familiar with Arkansas's roster and the, and the SEC. And then he enlisted the help of, Anthony Ruta, who is Arkansas's now Arkansas's director of basketball operations, Pat Ackerman, um, who works in recruiting, and he got his son, oldest son Michael, who's also in recruiting. Those two guys, Ackerman and, and Michael Musselman, head up Arkansas's Arkansas basketball was recruiting. He got them to help him put together some really really detailed interview books for Yurichek and John Fag. Musselman, I quoted him in the story. He said, those interview books, they had some statistical stuff on the current roster and a plan for what our recruiting cycle would look like. Depth charts for years one, two, three, and four. Uh, yeah, and what wow. our playbook would look like. It had Arkansas personnel and Arkansas depth charts in the playbook. This man is known for bringing in graduate transfers, known for anything but like the players that are in year four on the roster there more than likely there's going to be like a 99 percent turnover like the people that are freshmen on this team which they ended up i don't did they they didn't have a freshman on the team this year did they i don't believe so yeah i i almost didn't want to say this I was like that can't be right but i don't think that they did because yeah anyway the he's not even known for that but he's preparing like he is and he's and like he's preparing like what it could look like, what things could happen. That's insane, the preparation that this man did. And I think it really, really, really paid off. So later on the day um, that Hunter Yurichek offered Eric the job, Danielle said that they did everything they could to switch their plane tickets from the Final Four, which was in Minneapolis. And they tried to get back as early as they could, but they couldn't leave too early because Danielle had a speaking engagement. So they got back like as quick as they could, which around 9 p.m. And that's when they had to tell Mariah 
they had to break the news to Mariah, their daughter. She was nine at the time. And Danielle said that was literally the only part of the whole, the whole ordeal that, that made her sad. Said Mariah started crying like immediately when they told her, but she also said, um, she said, I'm so happy for you, dad. And then like, that's a, like that moment right there. That's a moment like neither of them are going to forget. Like she was just, she was on board and she was like, it was like, she knew even at nine years old, that was like, this is the job that my dad wants. And like, this is the job that he, he really wants to go after. So they flew from Reno to Fayetteville and then they went straight to Juracek's house. And that's where he met with the, the team. That's where the, the clip where he said, I think we have enough talent in this room to make the NCAA tournament. That was that night. Mm -hmm. So they get there. Obviously, like, could you imagine like flying from Reno into Fayetteville and you're meeting all these people for the first time? Like there's obviously some nerves. Right. So Juracek makes a joke that kind of eases all of the nerves for the Musclemans. And he said, Danielle said that your check and his wife are big dog people and we're big dog, we're big dog people too. This is, um, I didn't, Danielle said, I didn't know that upon meeting him. So I took our little dog when they showed up to the house and put him in the car in the driveway. So he wouldn't run up and jump all over him. Like that's, I mean, I feel like that, that's pretty smart. Like you, you don't want your dog attacking your company. Like I get it. Yeah. So Danielle goes on to say, it wasn't until later, once Eric had gotten the job, when Hunter said, I didn't know if you were some crazy dog abuser because we saw this little dog trapped in the car when we pulled up. And we weren't so sure about you guys. <laughs> Poor Swish. He's just stuck in the car. Yeah. He oh is my. stuck in the car and then he gets delegated to doggy daycare all day. Poor Swish. He wasn't there for any of the entertainment. He couldn't, uh, he can't tell his doggy friends that he was a part of the story. Yeah, Eric that was crazy. But Dan Danielle, while Eric was like diving headfirst into like the basketball side of things with Ruta, Pat Ackerman and, and Michael Musselman, Danielle was doing like all the off the court studying on Arkansas. Like she wanted to know as much as she could about Fayetteville, where to live, wanted to know more about the Northwest Arkansas area, the state, you know, she's got family in South Arkansas, so she's somewhat familiar, but we all know that South Arkansas and Northwest Arkansas are a little, a little bit different. Yeah. So she was doing all the off the court studying while, while Eric, you know, locked himself in his, locked himself in a room and was watching all that game tape. And I, I asked her, I was like, so what's it like for you when Eric, you know, just g gets in one of those modes where he's just like, I'm just going to watch tape. And he mm -hmm. said he watched tape for like 20 hours. I remember Bob asked him that at the introductory press conference. Mm -hmm. And Danielle's like, no, when he gets in those, when he gets in those moods or the where he's just hyper focused on on work, it's just one of those deals where I just kind of like slide a, a plate of food at the door and just walk away, <laughs> and maybe he'll stick his hand out and grab it. <laughs> it was great. It was those were a couple of really fascinating interviews. That's awesome. Danielle Musselman is a fantastic interview as well as Eric. Um, when you and especially when you get them together, I've enjoyed watching them get to interview the players that they signed from this class as well um she's she's a a treat in a good perspective i think yeah. from that entire story well, that's eric musselman as i said quintessential eric musselman what you would expect now after one year of seeing what eric musselman can do at the university of arkansas i'm just slightly curious who that other power five team was that reached out but... me too me too i didn't ask maybe i sh maybe i should have but I don't, I don't know. know. You don't want to press the, too hard. The likelihood that he answers and yeah. I mean, if a, he would have told me, it would have, I mean, I would have had to have been like, okay, off the record, who was the other power five? And yeah. I wouldn't have been able to put it in the story. So, and so it wouldn't matter anyway. And I wouldn't have been able to say it on the podcast either. So, it would yeah. have been a betrayal of trust. Exactly. And we can't do that. But there was another head coach that is a basketball coach at the University of Arkansas. And uh, their hiring story is unique as well because. There's a guy in Mike Neighbors that was all the way on the West Coast, but had always, always, always wanted to be a Razorback and be a Razorback head coach. Always. So Mike Neighbors grew up in, in Greenwood. He graduated from Arkansas in 93. And, you know, I asked Mike Neighbors, I was like, this is probably going to sound like a silly question because I know your background, but like, why was Arkansas your dream job? And he was like, well, I was cut from baseball and couldn't play basketball and so like the next best thing for me was to to like try to get into arkansas in some way as a coach 
And so like he, I, I asked him just the same way I asked Eric Musselman. I was like, so take me back to 2017 when, you know, everything, like tell me where your story started when Arkansas first like came into the picture. He was then the head coach at Washington. He was fresh off of a Final Four run in 2016. And so fast forward about a year, they're in the Pac, Washington is in the Pac-12 tournament. They're getting ready to play Oregon in Key Arena in Seattle. And he's on the team bus heading to the arena when he finds out that Jimmy Dykes has resigned as Arkansas's women's basketball coach after three years. Those three years didn't go very well. And what is it? You want to say something? I want to say something. I don't know if I've ever told anybody this, but I, uh, or at least made it public knowledge, but there, there's just certain things that, um, working for Razorback Sports Network, like I did when I was in college, that you're just around things and stuff that's happening, right? And you can't tell anybody at the time. And I'm gonna I'm gonna tell this story now uh, because it's past, and I don't really think anybody that is important is gonna listen to this podcast anyway. Let's hear it. But I was working a basketball game, not a basketball game, a baseball game, and you have to get there like two hours early before the game, make sure everything is working, and so. We get there and we do what's called a fact, uh, fax. And so you, you check to make sure everything's working all right and this stuff. And then you just kind of wait. Uh, you maybe pre-produce some stuff, but you just kind of wait. And so I'm waiting there and I'm like, all right, I'm going to get up and tell my worker. So all of the stuff for Razorback Sports Network is in the bottom of Bud Walton Arena. It's in the basement. And so I tell my person I'm working beside, I'm like, hey, I'm going to go use the restroom. No big deal. So you have to walk a decent ways you walk by and you walk by this office and everything, no big deal. And I look in and there's two people meeting with Jimmy Dykes. Don't think anything of it. I use the bathroom. I come back. I'm working in the middle of the baseball game. It breaks that Dykes is resigning. And I looked over at my coworker and I went, I did. I didn't just see him. Wow. Did you saw in a meeting? You saw the meeting. I I was like, did did I? And I was like, well, no, 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 because uh, at that time, it was Jeff Long. It's like Jeff Long wasn't there, so obviously, I, I was I was trying to rationalize it in my brain. I was like, probably what more than likely happened is he had already been, you know, let go or resigned or whatever, and they were kind of just walking through what else would happen. The next steps. Yeah, and, yeah. Je- and Jeff had already departed and was probably at the baseball game or something. But I, I I walked by and there was Jimmy Dykes and two other people in a in a conference room, and I put two and two together after that, and I went. I'm so sorry. I think I just, I think I just saw that happen. That's crazy. It's a little wild. Um, so it's just, you know, information that you're privy to that when you work and you're just around everything, you just happen to happen upon stuff every once in a while. But yeah, that's, that's what I, I happened upon that day. Um, uh, so funny story about Jimmy Dykes. Yeah. That's a story you'll probably never forget. Yeah. No, it was interesting. For sure. So you back to neighbors like his, um, he finds out that the Arkansas job has come open while he's on the bus heading to that Pac-12 tournament game with, against Oregon. And he told me, he's like, you hear that the job is open. And at that time, you know, he's just trying to focus on the game. They're getting ready to play. But Washington got beat that night by Oregon, despite 34 points from Kelsey Plum and then Chantel Osahor, who is on, now on Mike Neighbors' staff. She had 27 rebounds in that game. That's so crazy. But Oregon had Sabrina Ionescu and of course. a couple other really good players. Like they were, I think only five players in that game scored for Oregon, but like three of them scored, you know, all but like four or five points, I think. So that, that Oregon team was really good. So Jimmy Dykes resigns and Washington loses in the Pac-12 tournament to Oregon on March 3rd, 2017. And so you, you and like, we know that, we have to wait a little while longer for the the women's NCAA tournament selection show than you do for the men's sometimes because the women's tournament, the women's conference tournaments end earlier. So Neighbors has from March 3rd to March 13th between that, that Oregon loss to the selection show. And so it was written into Neighbors' contract that, you know, if he was going to talk to another program about a potential job, that he had to be like he was required contractually to tell Washington administration. And he told them immediately, he was like, listen, I don't know if Arkansas is going to call me, but if they call me, I am talking to them. And so it was 
So between the Pac-12 tournament and the selection show, Mike Neighbors did not talk to Jeff Long, who then was the athletic director. He talked to Julie Cromer Peoples. Everybody's favorite person. And so Julie Cromer Peoples essentially tells him, you know, she made him feel really comfortable um, about the whole thing. She was like, hey, I know you've got bigger things to do. Let's pay attention to what's going on with, with your team. And, you know, when the appropriate time comes, you give me a call. So neighbors, Washington team gets a three seed in the NCAA tournament. They're 27 and five. Like they're, they're playing their first two games at home. So they beat Montana state and they beat Oklahoma. They beat an Oklahoma team that featured Chelsea Dungy. Chelsea Dungy. And neighbors was like, it's funny that we saw Chelsea Dungy in that game because we could not guard her. Just couldn't guard her. I mean, they blew Oklahoma out, but they still had, they still had trouble defending Chelsea Dungy. And so, Mississippi State was up next in Oklahoma City. Like, that's where their Sweet 16, that's where they had to go for the Sweet 16 and then the the Elite Eight if they were to win. So they get to – they're going to Oklahoma City. Mike Neighbors tells his team, just as he did the year before when they went to the Final Four, you're packing four sets of clothes, you know, for the Sweet 16, the Elite Eight, Final Four, championship game. Like, that, that was the plan the year before. They're doing that again. Neighbors knew – when he was packing for that trip that he had there was like there was a a chance hopefully probably that he was going to get to talk to Arkansas one way or the other once you know Washington was done playing in Oklahoma City so they they traveled to Oklahoma for the sweet 16 and they lose to Mississippi State so after the game they take care of everything that needs to be done with the with his current team at Washington and then Neighbors meets up with some of his family members and they drive to Arkansas and they meet with Arkansas the next day. And at that point, he was just, he just, he went all in and he was telling himself, you know, I'm not going to let, he said, I'm not going to play games. I'm not going to play coy and I'm not going to potentially let my ego get in the way of a job that might not come back around again. And basically, I mean, that was, he, he had to make sure while while Arkansas definitely was his dream job, the women's program at the time was in a bad place. Right. It just was really in a bad place. And so he as much as he said as much as he dreamed about taking that Arkansas job, which is one that he had always wanted, he had to go make sure he had to go see this like where the program was and he had to make sure that it wasn't impossible to turn around. And so after that, he just after he had to pay a pretty big buyout, which was close to a million dollars. But he said yeah. he said it was totally worth it, totally worth it. So the week after Washington season ended, he flew to the Final Four, and then he left the Final Four in Dallas, flew to Seattle, met his team, and broke the news that he was leaving for Arkansas. And after that, he went back to the airport, and he flew a commercial red eye back to Arkansas. And then on April 3rd, he was he was named the, the coach at Arkansas, and then the following day he was he was introduced in the basketball performance center. Do all coaches go to the Final Four? That, that's a big gathering spot for coaches. For I was sure. just just yeah. curious because the two stories that we've told today: Eric Musselman went to the Final Four. Oh yeah, neighbors I mean, yeah, went to the Final Four. That's where that's where it happens. Okay, just just curious. So that I mean, regardless of if your team makes it or not, you're going to the Final Four for some reason huh yeah for sure okay so another interesting thing that i found out talking to neighbors for the story was that you know everybody in his orbit when they found out that the arkansas job was open they were like you're so you're going to take the arkansas job right like it's a, it's a no-brainer neighbors kept his he kept things really close to the vest with the people in his circle and he didn't really talk to a whole lot of people or many people, but there was one guy that he did talk to. His name was Boyd Shelton. And Boyd Shelton is important in this story because when Neighbors was fresh out of college, he got a job at Bentonville High School. And Boyd Shelton coached bas- boys basketball at Bentonville from 1984. Or Let me go back and make, double check this. Yeah, he, he coached boys basketball at Bentonville from 1984 to 98, and then he retired after 98. Neighbors was an assistant. His first job out of college was 
as an assistant under Boyd Shelton on the boys' basketball team. A couple of years later, I think they they had some overturn at the in the Bentonville girls program, and so neighbors took over the the girls program and turned it around. I mean, they went like one and twenty four one year, and then two years later they're like in the state championship game. So you can kind of see like that's that's when the attention starts coming to neighbors a little bit. It was like, hey, this guy this guy can really coach. He can really develop players. And he can he can relate to people from all walks of life, really. So Boyd Shelton was one of the few guys that Mike Neighbors was talking to in that period, you know, bef- between the end of Washington season and when he took the Arkansas job. And Boyd Shelton told me, quote, he wanted to come to Arkansas for many reasons. You've got family members there. That's where he graduated, and he started right down the road with us. We talked about him possibly coming to Arkansas. I just encouraged him to keep hanging in there, and eventually it would happen. And it did. That's so cool. It was really cool. It was like the guy that he's talking to. One of the, one of the few people that Mike Neighbors is talking to during this process is a guy that you know helped him, you know, get his start coaching basketball. So that, it, it it really meant a lot to Boyd Shelton. And I actually got a text from Boyd today saying that um, he appreciated the story and including him in the story. But he appreciated that Mike Neighbors, you know, just never forgot, you know, where he's where he started. Neighbors is a man with a plan as well. If you're around him, he'll talk pretty freely around you. I mean, he doesn't know necessarily you very well. I covered some of the Razorback women's basketball stuff this year. And, you know, he was he was very willing to talk about whatever you wanted to on camera. But even off camera, he's talking about his plan that he has for the basketball team and comparing it to other people. What, I, th- I think you mentioned Coach Schaefer, who is now at Texas, but was at Mississippi State for forever, how he turned that program around. Um, just looking at other coaches and using their Coach Blair at Texas A&M that led them all the way to a national title, he use, utilizes those. And you know he's saying, hey, all of these things had to fall into place for us to be here. And, and he really considers that the University of Arkansas getting to the NCAA tournament in year three of his time back is – really ahead of schedule more so than he was expecting from the turnarounds that he had observed from other places. So he's really excited about that. And I'm really excited to see what he does with the women's basketball program moving forward. I think he's a good, a, the, a good man for the head job and it'll be a, it'll be interesting. He's entertaining regardless. Oh, absolutely. And a new father, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. So congrats to him. If he's listening, probably yeah. Pretty slim chance he is, but if you are, congrats. Congrats to Mike Neighbors. All right, moving on, Scotty. One more thing before I get you in here with our game that we're going to end it with. And academic progress reports. Slightly confused. You help me understand this a little bit more. So for those people that are out there that may be slightly confused about APR and what Arkansas, you know, they have a low number in men's basketball and football. Or should Should fans be worried about that low number? So, from what I understand, the APR scoring formula that the NCAA has used since I think 2004, 2005, to explain this, like each each person receiving athletic related financial aid earns one point for staying in school, and one point for being academically eligible during the during both semesters, so the fall and the spring semester, for a maximum of four points per school year. Um. So, I mean, you look at those numbers, some of them, like especially the the football number, I think is pretty alarming because it's below, it's below 900. Which is and not I think good. like that's a, that's as Bob, I think Bob wrote in his story, it's pretty clear that, you know, the, all of the, I think Bob wrote in his story that there were 24 players mm-hmm. who transferred out in Chad Morris's first year. And so you get guys who are not in good academic standing transferring out. Like that, obviously, that that hurts your your APR score, and I, so I like the way Bob put it in his story. Players' academic records are protected by privacy laws, but for a sport to be awarded an APR retention point for transfer, he has to not only be academically eligible but carry at least a two point six grade point average in the final semester. Next paragraph: The APR math makes it clear many of the transfers under Morris did not meet that standard. Yeah, that's about as plainly and as bluntly as you can put it, which is. 100% correct. Right. So for basketball, basketball has, according, Matt texted me this yesterday. He said that's two years in a row that basketball has come in under the benchmark. and Which the benchmark is 920, correct? 
I think uh, it's 9.30. 9.30. So. Yeah, because their benchmark was 9.30. Arkansas needs, Arkansas's basketball program needs a couple of pretty strong years or it could, like these numbers could catch up to them in the multi-year and that could bring some penalties like loss of scholarship, that kind of thing. Um, it's just something yeah, to it's, it's, watch it's out for. It's kind of confusing. I'm glad, Matt, I'm glad Matt understands all this. And if you're more confused now than when we started, I understand. We will link Bob's story and Matt's story in the description. Make sure to check those out. They can explain it. But uh, basically, your awarded points for for uh, not only graduating, but just having a good academic standing. Um, you get a certain amount of points. Transfers don't. It's a complicated process. I'd encourage you to read the story. So in Bob's story, I'm just going to read a couple of graphs from Bob's story. During the 2011-12 season, Mike Anderson's first as Arkansas's coach, the team suffered the loss of a scholarship as a penalty imposed by the NCAA for having an 892 score for the previous four years. And then John Fagg is quoted in this story, the APR in basketball is slightly different because the group is so much smaller, which that makes sense. Mm -hmm. The football team potentially has more than 85 student athletes that we're monitoring because we're monitoring medical hardships. We're monitoring fifth year guys in basketball. You have a couple of guys transfer and that number can drop pretty quickly. So perspective. Yeah. So, but going back to Matt's text, I think like the program needs a couple of, a couple of strong years, a couple of strong years. And I think they can, they can get back on track. And for both of the programs, men's basketball and football with consistent leadership, maybe they can get back there now with a, basketball getting or basketball getting muscleman and with football hiring Sam Pittman. All right, Scotty. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's do it. All right, just a refresher. What's going to happen here is I am going to play a clip from some press conferences that I went back and I found. Scotty is going to try and guess who they are talking about. And if it is a coach other than Eric Musselman, he's going to try and guess the coach as well. So these are just clips that I found from all over. We will start, I guess let's just start at the top, Scotty. All right. Let's do it. First one. You know, he's a tough matchup because he's, uh, um, you know, he can score in a low post. He's got a great mid-range game. And I thought he kind of got him going there early on. All right, Scotty. Do you need me to play one more time? Yeah, if you don't mind. You know, he's a tough matchup because he's, uh, um, you know, he can score in a low post. He's got a great mid-range game. And I thought he kind of got him going there early on. I think that's Frank Haith talking about Jimmy Witt. Ding, ding, ding. Nailed them both. How about that? Nailed them both. That was Frank Haith after the Tulsa game talking about Jimmy Witt. The, the mid-range game kind of gave it away a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I mean, the... He's scoring in the low post thing. That threw me for a loop. For the, I'm like, who is doing that on Arkansas's roster? But the mid-range game helped me out. Okay, here we go. Number two on the list. He's just playing with more confidence. You know, you can, and he's and he's really been really really good at home. Um, you know, now we need him to carry that that confidence and. And that bravado in, uh, onto a road game as well, because I do think he's played really good basketball at home, um, and we need him to, to have a big road game as well. He's talking about the goat, <laughs> Desi Sills. I asked that question. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I was just about to say, do you know who asked that question? I did. <laughs> do you know that that was the second question you asked about Desi Sills I in did, that yep. press conference? I did. <laughs> yep, for sure. <laughs> Okay, I had to throw a Desi. Yes, I kind of like. I feel like I stumbled through the question. I'm just like, I, I want to ask about Desi again, but I don't really know how to phrase it. So I'm just like, I grabbed the mic. And I'm like, remember, I've kind of put my hands out to the side, and I'm like, just, what have you thought about De like how Desi's played lately? Like he seems like he's playing really well at home, but there, you're getting ready to go play Georgia. Yes, I remember the, that. Yep. Getting ready to go play Georgia, Holy and then smokes. he, yeah, he had a great game at Georgia. Yes, he did. That's incredible. Very, very, very proud of you there, Scotty. All right, here we go. Number three on the list. Let's do let's do this one. You know, he he's really good at changing pace, changing speed. Um, uh, he's got that high dribble, hesitation move. 
um, which was uh, interesting. And um, so, uh, um, you know, he's, he's good. He's a good player, very good player. Play that for me again. I think I know who the coach is, but I'm not 100% sure on the player. You know, he he's really good at changing pace, changing speed. Um, uh, he's got that high dribble, hesitation move, um, which was uh, interesting. And um, so, uh, um, you know, he's, he's good. He's a good player, very good player. It's Jamie Dixon. That's, that's the opposing coach, TCU's head coach, exactly. I want to say he's talking about uh, Mason Jones. Correct. He, during this entire press conference, going back and listening to it, he, he opens it up by complaining about how they got three uh, carrying violations. Oh, and then yeah. you could tell kind of through the out in the entire thing, like even then when he's commenting Ma, uh, Mason on his high dribble That's interesting. Move, yeah, that's uh, interesting. Uh, uh, he's, that's interesting. Yeah, he's just trying to call him out that he thinks that's a carry and yeah. all his guys are getting carried. But yeah, he, he literally opened that press conference by saying, well, I've never had three carrying calls called in one game. So Yeah, that was pretty bizarre. It was indeed, but he was not happy during that entire press conference. In fact, he, that was one of the ones that uh, he la- he called out Bob. Right? Not necessarily called out Bob, but Bob. He poked a little fun at him, yeah. Yeah, because Bob was asking about the tee. He got a tee because uh, he said, quote, unquote, from Dixon was, uh, that's a carry. And he said he got teed up for that. Whether or not the uh, tape proves that, we'll leave it I up to him. I think it did. Him. We'll leave it up to him. Okay, here we go. This is a very familiar voice, and let's see who they are talking about. He did a great job on pick and roll coverages, um, going back and evaluating the film. Uh, He did a great job also affronting the post against Fulkerson. I thought he altered some of Fulkerson's shots. Yeah, let's talk about Ethan Henderson. The Fulkerson's kind of a giveaway, but I couldn't find a better one for him. But... Fulkerson team that he played on. Oh, Tennessee. And so that was after the Tennessee game, in between the Tennessee game and Arkansas's next game on the schedule. Uh, the Tennessee game at home and the right. Arkansas's next game on the schedule, which was, is that Missouri? I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't remember, remember either. But that was between those two games. And of course that was Eric Musselman. So you don't get bonus points. So yeah, far you're Ethan, perfect. Ethan Henderson was, was great in that Tennessee game in Bud. So far, you are perfect. We have two more, Scotty. All right, here we go. Our passing becomes a lot better. Our rebounding becomes a lot better. Our offensive flow becomes a lot better. Okay, so I have to do a little bit of qualification. He is talking about a player, and when this player is on the court, this happens. Our passing becomes a lot better. Our rebounding becomes a lot better. Our offensive flow becomes a lot better. I had to take it and had to edit it there because he said the player's name right before this. Got to be talking about Isaiah Joe, right? Is he talking about Isaiah Joe? Our passing becomes a lot better. Our rebounding becomes a lot better. Our offensive flow becomes a lot better. I mean, this is a this is a tricky one. Is it? It could. Be, is it Jalen Harris? Hmm. I threw this one in here just to. See, because I, I figured you'd get the other one, so I wanted to make one really hard. Yeah, there's just like, there's like no context. <laughs> I mean, I would initially, like my, my first thought was always oh, talking about Isaiah. Which is fair, but that is not correct. Hmm. All right, you ready? Yeah. Key word here. Here's your hit. Rebounding. Oh, he's talking about Jimmy Witt? Adriel Bailey? No. Nope. Oh my God, dude. Like, is it Mason Jones? This is before the season started. Does that help again? This oh, is- Connor Vanover? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would have never gotten that. Yeah, I wanted to throw one in there that was hard. So he's talking about uh, this is right after the red white game, right after you've seen what Connor Vanover can do with the team. And he's talking about how that he helps the team and whenever he will know about a waiver. So that was a hard one. Yeah, that was tough. I want, I, because I figured you were going to get the rest of these, so I didn't want to. I was, I'm really surprised, though, about these coaches. You're doing a good job. I recognize them just by yeah, voice. Yeah, I can recognize their voices, for sure. All right, this is an assistant coach that visited Bud Walton Arena. 
he did everything for him tonight. I mean, he rebounded the ball um, whenever the, the offense um, stalled any. You know, he was the guy that was making big shots for him. You know, I thought if we, without his play in the first half, maybe we could have got a, a you know a, a little separation. But um, he he definitely held you know held, held it together for them in the first half. I am drawing a blank right after I said I can recognize coaches' voices. I got it one more time. He did everything for him tonight. I mean, he rebounded the ball um, whenever the, the offense um, stalled any. You know, he was the guy that was making big shots for him. You know, I thought if we, without his play in the first half, maybe we could have got a, a you know a, a little separation. But um, he he definitely held you know held, held it together for them in the first half. Who's he talking about? Jimmy Witt, probably. Mm-hmm. He's talking about Jimmy Witt. Do you need a hint? Is it cheating if I pull the schedule up? <laughs> I'll give you a hint. Okay. It's an SEC East team. Was oh, that Quanzo Martin? That is not Quanzo Martin. Hmm. Oh, Jerry Stackhouse. There you go. You got it. I was about to give you another hint. But you you processed through. That is Jerry Stackhouse on Jimmy Witt after he kind of held the game together. It was a close game between Arkansas and Vanderbilt. That was Arkansas's second SEC game because they opened the SEC play with uh, they, uh, Buzz Williams in Texas A&M. Yeah, I think that was their fourth. Their fourth. They, oh. Texas A&M, LSU, Ole Miss, oh, and then Vanderbilt. But yeah, Second one at home. Pardon me. Yeah. I, I apologize. Yeah, second there. one at home. Um, I got carried away. That was fun. We should keep doing that. We should keep doing that. I'm going to try and find trouble. some more. Um, it, it was getting tough because half the time they mentioned their names. Yeah. Except for Buzz Williams. Buzz Williams' interview was unique. He's, he's very he detailed. He calls guys by their team, numbers. But he calls them by their numbers, uh, which I thought was interesting. I'll try and find some more. We'll try and keep uh, something going at least. But uh, Yeah, keep, that, that Jerry, St- Jerry Stackhouse's voice just didn't register with me. And I guess it was just the deep first, voice. first year. Yeah, exactly. You haven't seen him more than once because Arkansas played them in the SEC tournament and you weren't there yet you, because they canceled it. Right. I guess I'll get over that one day. All right. Scotty, anything else you'd like to add? Do you want to dive into your Vanover story anymore? Uh, I think that if you want some more information about Vanover, uh, you can listen to last week's basketball podcast in Mid-America. I gave you a lot of background there. Uh, I will make sure to put the link in the description so that you can listen to it at just a fun overall interview. Like I've said multiple times, I grew up um, and going to the same high school as Connor Vanover did. I got to see him when he was in seventh grade and seven foot tall and hitting door frames. I would also encourage you to find his TikTok. Yeah, I watched I watched the one that the latest one that's mm-hmm. been going around with his his three brothers. The, that one was that one was really funny. The one on the left is Brandon, and Brandon and I are decent, good, decently good friends. And um, I, I played against Brandon. There is a picture of me and him playing at the Pinnock Boys and Girls Club in Little Rock. And I am in fifth or sixth grade, and Brandon is already a foot to a foot and a half taller than me. Wow. And he is in the post with the ball, and I am trying to guard him. It's hilarious. So I've been around the Vanovers a little bit, but, yeah, I'd encourage you to read that story. It's really cool to catch up with him. That'll be in the link in the description. But for Scotty Bordelon and our entire Whole Hog Sports crew, I am Seth Campbell saying so long. We'll see you back here next week. Thank you.